At this moment, the greatest threats come from the Middle East and North Africa, where radical groups exploit grievances for their own gain. And one of those groups is ISIL, which calls itself the Islamic State. And ISIL is certainly not a state. It was formerly al-Qaeda's affiliate in Iraq and has taken advantage of sectarian strife and Syria's civil war to gain territory on both sides of the Iraq-Syrian border. It is recognized by no government nor by the people it subjugates. ISIL is a terrorist organization, pure and simple, and it has no vision other than the slaughter of all who stand in its way. So ISIL poses a threat to the people of Iraq and Syria and the broader Middle East, including American citizens, personnel, and facilities. If le left unchecked, these terrorists could pose a growing threat beyond that region, including to the United States. Obama is lying about Syria, and he has been since he first started claiming that America needed to interfere with its internal affairs. Moreover, his blundering has the world on the brink of war. An exposition of the mess Obama has made in Syria requires the examination of five points. First, the fundamental dispute between the Sunnis and the Shia began in 632 when Muhammad died. That is 1384 years ago. That is more than a century. Furthermore, the dispute is no closer to being resolved now than it was when it first began. When Muhammad died, there were two claimants to the leadership of Islam. One was the father of Muhammad's wife. He led what are now called the Sunnis, and they make up 85% of the Muslim population. The other was Muhammad's cousin. He led what are now called the Shia, and they are 15% of the Muslim population. The Sunnis are the majority in Syria. However, the government is Shia. Order has been maintained through reforms and effective military power, including a loyal officer corps. The Sunnis and the Shia agree that Allah is the only God and that Muhammad is his messenger. They both follow the five pillars of Islam and they share the Quran. The Sunnis rely on Muhammad and his teachings and hold that leadership is a matter of earned trust, not a birthright. The Shia hold their ayatollahs who ascend by birthright as reflections of God on earth. Muslim extremism tends to be a product of Sunni dogmatism. ISIS is a Sunni group of extremists, and it is largely funded by the United States and its allies, including Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Second, this is not the first time the United States has destabilized the government in Syria. The fact of the matter is that the first of several interventions was in 1949, just after the CIA was formed, and just after Syria was liberated from France. The democratically elected president did not agree to the Trans-Arabian Pipeline, which was an American project to connect the oil fields of Saudi Arabia with the ports of Lebanon. Syria did not agree to have that pipeline cross its land. The CIA engineered a coup, and the president was replaced with a dictator. In 1955, the Syrian people re-elected their president. Having learned his lesson about America, he now leaned towards the Soviet Union. This blowback was completely avoidable because the Soviet Union had previously offered the United States a deal under which the Middle East would be a Cold War neutral zone. The United States refused that offer. In 1956, the CIA went back into Syria. They tried to destabilize the government by arming and inciting militants and by bribing military officers. This coup failed. The CIA was unable to corrupt the military officers. The CIA did not give up. They tried to persuade Turkey to invade Syria, but after amassing its troops on the border, Turkey backed down in the face of unified Arab opposition. Later, the CIA plotted with the Muslim Brotherhood to assassinate Syrian government officials. All of this pointless espionage solidified Syria's alliance with Russia. Third, the propaganda from Obama is that our military support for the Syrian insurgency is humanitarian in nature. This is not true. The truth is that it is a proxy war over pipelines and geopolitics. The Syrian civil war did not begin with the peaceful protests in the Arab Spring of 2011. It began in 2000 when Qatar proposed to construct a pipeline through Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, and Turkey. This pipeline would have linked the gas fields between Qatar and Iran with Europe. This pipeline is the purple line on the map. 
This pipeline would have given the Sunni kingdoms domination of the world natural gas markets and would have strengthened Qatar, America's closest ally in the Arab world. I'll put the map back up in a minute. Europe, which gets 30% of its gas from Russia, also wanted the pipeline. Gas would be cheaper and the Europeans would have some relief from Putin's leverage. Turkey in particular was anxious to be free from its reliance on Russia. Saudi Arabia wanted the pipeline because it would help contain the power of Iran. The Russians, on the other hand, viewed the proposed pipeline as an economic threat. They sell 70% of their gas exports to Europe. From their point of view, the pipeline is a NATO plot to deprive Russia of its foothold in the Middle East and to strangle its economy by closing off its European gas markets. In 2009, Syria announced that it would not permit the Qatar pipeline to run through its country. In adding insult and injury to the United States, Syria announced that it would instead support a pipeline from Iran's side of the gas field through Syria to Lebanon. This is the red line on the map. This pipeline would make Iran the principal supplier of gas to Europe. Needless to say, this turn of events angered Western financial interests and alarmed Israel. The intelligence services of the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Israel decided immediately to foment Sunni rebellion in Syria to overthrow its uncooperative Shia government. The CIA immediately began funding opposition groups in Syria. The United States joined France, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and England in forming the Friends of Syria coalition, which formally demanded the removal of Syria's president. By 2012, Turkey, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia were arming training and funding radical Sunni jihadists from Syria and Iraq to overthrow the government in Syria. The Syria government reacted to the CIA-led rebellion. This polarized the Sunni-Shia divide in Syria and gave the United States politicians a basis on which to lie that the war for the pipeline was a humanitarian effort. Fourth, Obama claims that the mess he has made in Syria is an organic and moderate uprising against a brutal tyrant. This claim is not true. Not only was the rebellion instigated by the CIA and America's allies, but also the fighters we have employed are known jihadists. Obama knows exactly who the fighters are. After Bush led the foolish invasion of Iraq, his local governor, Paul Bremer, made the galactically stupid decision to bar Sunnis from positions in the new government. This decision included firing all of the Sunnis in Iraq's military services. This decision put more than 300,000 battle-hardened and angry soldiers on the streets with no money and nothing to do. The United States, under the questionable judgment of General Petraeus, aggravated this toxic situation by using brutal suppression tactics illegally developed in Latin America against the resistance. This ignited sectarian violence, which continues to this day. Eventually, the insurgency began to call itself Al-Qaeda of Iraq. Beginning in 2011, America and its allies adopted the Arab proverb that the enemy of my enemy is my friend and started paying and supplying these insurgents, these Sunni jihadists, Al-Qaeda of Iraq, to invade Syria. However, events have proven that Obama should have been more careful in how he chose his friends. While these jihadists were as effective as we expected them to be, they also proved to be unreliable as friends. Instead of serving American interests once they were in Syria, they changed their name to ISIS, formed their own caliphate, and pursued their own economic interests. Fifth, this double cross was predictable and in fact was predicted. A defense intelligent report to Obama in August 2012 argued that the Sunni jihadists, which the United States had employed to destabilize Syria, would form their own caliphate in the Sunni regions of Syria and Iraq. This report made the point that these Sunni jihadists had turned peaceful protests against the Syrian government into a Sunni-Shia war. This report also made the larger point that the Syrian conflict would expand into a global war for the control of the region's resources. This is, in fact, the current situation. We now have the West, the Gulf countries, and Turkey on one side, and Russia, China, and Iran on the other. This is more blowback from yet another in an unbroken streak of miscalculations by the CIA. Look at the history 
of that agency. Every time they intervene in another country's affairs, every time they foment revolution and regime change, we are saddled with a disaster. The miscalculation in Syria, unfortunately, appears to have brought us to the brink of world war. In conclusion, we've spent $6 trillion fighting over the control of natural resources in the Middle East since 9-11. This not only has achieved nothing for the American people, but also has made life worse for just about everyone on the planet. Hundreds of thousands of innocent people have been killed and millions more have had their lives devastated. Hostilities dating back centuries have been set loose in a torrent of predictable anger. Here in America, we've watched the lights go dim on the shining city on the hill as we've succumbed to the very forces the founding fathers warned us of. The way forward is obvious. First, we have got to respect the sovereign rights of foreign countries. Second, we have got to make a financial compromise to settle the current dispute. Third, we have got to evolve from our dependence on fossil fuels. ISIS is honoring President Obama. He is the founder of ISIS. He's the founder of ISIS. 